My mission is simple, to make you money. I'm here to level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to Mad Money. Welcome to Kramerica. I was going to make friends. I'm just trying to make you a little money. My job is not just to entertain, but to educate, put it all in context. Call me, 1-800-743-CBC. Tweet me, at Jim Kramer. Well, first day of the year, Dow inching up 26 points, S&P sinking 0.57%, and then Nasdaq plunging 1.63%. Part of what I spy as a sector rotation. And while it could be tough, perhaps even brutal for some stocks, I think it'll be temporary, the kind of thing that happens after a huge bull run like 2023. You know what? Today reminded me a lot of anomalous first days of the year that I've seen many times in my career. But this one especially, 1997. Uh, we were down at Disney World. The kids were out. And they were real small then. And we were about to go on the It's a Small World After All ride for the fourth time. I was at the lone phone booth fighting parents and children who wanted to make urgent calls. And I was in full-on panic mode, <laughs> screaming at the traders in my hedge fund office about the first day action. All the cyclicals, they were running like me. It was Armco Steel, Bethlehem Steel, Reynolds Metals, Phelps Dodge. And they were going crazy to the upside. And there I was, stuck, waiting for a boat to come by so we could slide in and sing. It's a world of laughter, a world of tears. It's a world of hopes and a world of fears. Naked, without a cyclical in the darn portfolio. I was missing everything. Unlike the canned small world, this was a real performance, the performance of a lifetime, and one without me in any sort of role. Just like today, when the snacks, Kalanova, the Pop-Tarts Bowl, where dreams come true. The cereals, General Mills, some Wheaties, drug stocks, J&J, forget the towel cases, and Merck, all scorching. Bye-bye. This time I was upstairs at the New York Stock Exchange, missing everything again, the performance of a lifetime. Although at least my travel trust owned the trusty Procter & Gamble Corporation. Now, it didn't take long but back in 1997 before the entire cyclical move collapsed. That first day move was doomed to report uh, doomed when once we started some of those weaker quarters, we got the numbers causing the whole move to reverse and then some. Hey, look, I'm not saying the food and drug stocks have definitely already peaked out here, but I do know that the first day of the year are tales of nothing. All you know is that some people believe the great runs and Magnificent Seven can't continue, at least for now. I actually agree. And others want to buy the beaten down pharma and food stocks. Eh, not so much. Welcome to the beginning of the year, folks where hope springs eternal for the Pfizer's and the Moderna's. It's time for the oils to have their day in the sun, and this is a moment where anything can happen. Maybe the end of the Fed rate hikes means buy stocks. Maybe an election year with an incumbent president means buy stocks. Maybe the momentum of the tape, nine straight up weeks, means buy stocks. Everything means buy stocks! And that is all I hear from everyone I bump into, talk to, and sit. Except in the end, we're actually talking about the performance of individual companies, people, because sooner or later, that too can have an impact on stock prices. Sure, stocks can change direction when the new year kicks off, but they rarely stay changed unless something else has happened beyond the turn of the calendar. So what should happen? According to my crystal ball, people will take profits in the best of the best, the ones that have defined this market. Yes, the Magnificent Seven and Friends, as well as the richly valued software enterprise names. I think investors will use that cash to invest in companies that haven't gotten any respect for ages. And here I think the banks, somewhat the drugs, somewhat the foods. Why not? They've gotten too cheap versus the market's outsized winners, the mega cap stocks that roared when Wall Street was worried about a recession. Because something like generative AI can transcend the broader market. Certainly help the economy. But if the economy is actually coming back, you have many more sectors to choose from than just pricey tech. That's what I think happens. Now, what else? The big issue for 2024, like the big issue for 2023, is, unfortunately, what will the Fed do? Right now, people are placing bets all over the map, just like last year, where the bets were repeatedly wrong. The narrative will be simple. The Fed cuts too much, three, four cuts. That means it's worried about a recession. If it doesn't cut enough, that means it'll cause a recession. Somehow, all roads lead to the recession. Now, listen, this is the kind of nonsense that will drive the action of much of the year because portfolio managers run big pools of money based in almost entirely on what the Fed does or might do. I don't want you to be one of those people. Oh, they'll trade off of every tick of the 10-year and the 30-year treasury. Don't be one of those people. They'll trade off of every statement from the Fed, every comment from Jay Powell, the press conferences. They'll trade off of every utterance by anyone, any connect to the Fed, the governors, the presidents, you name it. Don't be one of those people. Me, I say to heck with these traders. I run a charitable trust currently dedicated to the proposition that there are some companies that will do better than others in an environment where the Fed's no longer tightening. And historically, these are not the stocks that roared today. 
History says that after the Fed's done tightening, there's a sense of relief that allows all stocks to rally, especially the industrials. At the beginning of the year, there's a lot of repositioning by people who want to take profits from winners and buy beaten down losers. That usually continues until they see the next round of earnings, and then, upon further review, they swap back into what was working in December, often at a lower level. They come back to these stocks at lower levels because they're uncertain about whether there'll be a recession or not, and last year's big winners are the stocks you buy when you're simply uncertain. The MAG7. We expect that the artificial intelligence and enterprise software bubbles will be popped, but once those stocks come down to reasonable levels versus the traditional cyclicals, once again, they'll be bought. However, that only happens after a difficult interregnum where the crowd grows disillusioned with J-PAL and the rest of the Federal Reserve, and I think we're faced with that in a couple of days. What should you do? I think you need to have a worldview. That's a belief in what's really going to happen, rather than getting caught up in endless debates over the Fed's next move. Right now, we have an economy that grows with some strength and some tapering inflation, and that should allow us to pay reasonable price earnings multiples for stocks. With this setup, Wall Street pays more for the banks and the industrials while paying less for the Magnificent Seven and the enterprise software place. I like the personal computer stocks that haven't run yet out as an extension of AI. I also like the semiconductors inside of them. But that's a smaller universe of tech stocks that worked in 2023. How about pharma? Drug stocks often fare badly in election years. No thank you. Retail. I think they're finally getting their arms around the shoplifting problem, produce better returns, but Amazon looms. The oil's really difficult because we produce so much crude in this country that it's hard for prices to go higher and stay there. In the end, you need to find stocks that you can make your peace with because you believe in the companies behind them and you believe in what management can accomplish. As I tell CNBC Investing Club members every day where I, make some, I made some very big moves today, I think you'll be rewarded if you stick with stocks that are reasonably valued here, meaning not dramatically more expensive than the average member of the S&P 500 on a price earnings basis. I know, pedestrian way out. Expensive stocks get hurt while cheap stocks rally. Then they meet in the middle and the deck is reshuffled, give or take the endless Fed flop and chop. But the bottom line, that is how stocks can have a decent move, not as much as last year, but a good return nonetheless. I think meaningfully better than what you get from cash. So wait patiently for the sell-off that I'm expecting and then do some buying. Tyler in California, Tyler. Hey, Big Blue, I'm from California. How are you doing, Jim? I am doing well, Tyler. Good to talk to you. What's going on? All right, so I bought this stock in the low 80s on the 21st, and then on the 22nd, an inverse head and shoulders for them, so I started buying up. And today, the price, uh, the, the stock crossed the 200-day moving average. I'd like to know what you think of Moderna. Okay, I felt at the end of last year the Moderna was just too cheap, and I said that many times, and I believe in Stefan Bansell, and I can't believe it. The stock's finally getting its due. Maybe we're finally far enough away from the COVID hangover that people can see what I see, which is that this is a company with revolutionary technology. Joe in Indiana, Joe. Mr. Kramer, the Ayatollah Rock and Roller, the Duke of Wall Street. Sir, you've been talking a lot about parab stocks, and I think I have one by the horns. Help Chipotle. Wow. Um, Chipotle stock has been a rocket ship. I would like to think of it as not parabolic, given the fact it's been a lot of time going uh, between, say, 1800, 200, 1800, 2000, 2000. But if you feel that that is a parabolic move, I don't think so. But you should then you should trim some because it's been a tremendous winner. And I am against those who say don't take profits. I like to take profits. Let's go to Sam in Pennsylvania. Sam. Jim, boy, have I got an exciting one for you tonight. Okay. Listen, it is not every now and then that we see a trend as evident as what I am seeing with On Running. The company is just doing fantastic. I am a runner myself, and I have got to say they make a better shoe than Nike, and it's not just me. It is all of my college running friends. This shoe is the real deal. I look at their sales. I see growth. At 74% in 2022, uh, this looks to me, the valuation looks expensive, but this looks like it could be the next Lululemon. And I'm curious what you think. Uh, you know what? I got a pair of them for, uh, for the holidays, too. I was absolutely thrill thrilled, and other people around the table also got them, and I am a believer in oil holdings. I find sometimes that I'm very lonely, but then there's Sam in Pennsylvania telling me he agrees with me. Oil holdings could be a big winner. Nike still has great mind share, though. Let's go to Joe in New Jersey. Joe. Hello, Mr. Kramer. Joe. Thank you for taking my call. Of and course. on these, like, Today, I'm happy to be diversified so I don't take a big hit. I like that. I like that. I like that a lot. What's going on? 
Yes, with the reasonable P.E. and a high dividend, is it time to buy Kraft Heinz? Oh, uh, you know, look, this stock was at 30. It's at 42 uh, for the high. It's at 38. It, it, it yields four. It does not have a lot of growth. I'm going to have to say no. I don't want to buy that stock. There's others with better growth, and those are the ones I want to buy. All right, everyone's got a prediction for how this year will go in the market. But I think your best bet to ensuring a strong return is to find stocks you believe in that are relatively valued compared to the S&P 500. You're not buying anything too expensive, especially after the run we had in 2023. Reasonable, prosaic, it's what I feel. Man Money Tonight. It's the first trading day of the year, so I'm looking back at the top five Dow performers for 2023 to see if I can get, maybe make a little sense of what the new year could hold. Then, looking at the winners is just as important as analyzing the losers. You all missed my take on the bottom in the Dow. And is it time to start preparing for a pullback after 2023's late year run? I'm going to go off the charts with the legendary Larry Williams to find out, so stay with Kramer. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Cramer on X. Have a question? Tweet Cramer. Hashtag Mad Mentions. Send Jim an email to madmoney at cnbc.com. Or give us a call at 1-800-743-CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com.